International Version. Today's text is coming from the book of Numbers, the 12th chapter, and we'll be reading together verses 1 through 13. So if you don't mind, let me ask that you stand. And after we read, keep your Bibles handy because we will be using them today. So let us read in our loudest voice together, Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 through 13, which reads as follows, all together. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. At once, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them went out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When the two of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, Miriam's skin was leprous. It became as white as snow. Aaron turned toward her and saw that she had a defiling skin disease. And he said to Moses, please, my Lord, I ask you not to hold against us the sin we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, please God, heal her. You may be seated. May God add a blessing to the hearing, reading, and understanding of his holy word. And may God's word be a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy path. Today, my brothers and sisters, I would like to shine the sermonic spotlight, if you will, on that very first verse in the text, that very first verse in the text, which says, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. And it's from this text today I'd like to preach and hopefully teach with this simple thought in mind. Some things have yet to change. Some things have yet to change. Now, I don't usually begin my sermons with a joke. I leave that to Joel Osteen, but... <laughs> Today, I do have a little joke I'd like to bring to you because I believe it's relevant to today's message. So here it is. What did one pickle say to the other pickle who didn't get its way? Anybody know? What he said was, deal with it. All right, all right, I'll stick to my day job. I'll stick to my day job. But it is relevant, my brothers and sisters, because there is something in this country that people of color have been dealing with for many years. And when they bring it up, 
they are constantly told that they have to deal with it. What am I talking about? I am talking about this thing called racism. <laughs> there are many in this country who do not celebrate Black History Month. They undervalue it and they underappreciate it because of their racism. <laughs> Some would tell you that racism is not systemic. <laughs> But I would offer to you that anything that existed 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus and still exists 2,000 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that, my brothers and sisters, is systemic. So today we are going to talk about the fact that some things have yet to change. Now, when it comes to God, my brothers and sisters, I have learned that it's okay to speak in absolutes. When talking about God, it's okay to say God will never leave or forsake you. <laughs> it's okay to say God will always love you. But I've come to learn that when we are dealing with other people, when we are dealing with human beings, we should not speak in absolutes. <laughs> Some of you, like me, have been in an argument where we told the other person, you never fill in the blank, <laughs> or you always fill in the blank. <laughs> but we know that it is seldom, if ever, that people never do anything or always do something. So that's why I leave room, my brothers and sisters, for change. And rather than say some things will never change, I prefer to say some things have yet to change. It was in 1967 that Sidney Poitier, God bless his soul, starred in a controversial but aptly titled movie called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Some of y'all have seen that movie. It was a movie about an interracial couple who had to meet with their families and were faced with the problems and the uh, disunderstanding of racial tension in that particular time. And interestingly, and this is a fact, y'all, at the time that that movie was filmed, interracial marriage was illegal. It was outlawed in 17 states. Well, while our country has made some progress in racial reckoning since then, I believe most of us would agree we still have a long way to go. But it was two years later in 1969 that on the campus of Kent State University that some black educators and black students got together and proposed the idea of celebrating black history. And the first celebration, y'all, took place one year later in 1970 on the very campus of Kent State. <laughs> but it was six years later, y'all, in 1976 when then President Gerald Ford, <laughs> he recognized Black History Month on a national basis during part of the country's bicentennial. And President Ford, he urged all Americans to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every endeavor throughout this country. But you know and I know that black history did not begin in the 60s or in the 70s. You and I know black history did not begin in the 15th century during the Middle Passage. Some believe black history actually began in the Garden of Eden, where the Bible says the Nile and the Tigris rivers, they freely uh, flowed. But what cannot be disputed, beloved, is that black history is a part of the Old Testament Bible. Now, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. If you want to find yourself in the Bible, you've got to find yourself in the Bible. 
What do I mean? If you want to find if you played a part in biblical history, then you've got to read the book. You've got to open the book. You've got to study the only history book that is inspired and told by the only one who knows all history. The only one being God and the only book being the Holy Bible. So today, beloved, I'd like for you to take a journey with me, if you will, a biblical journey back through the annals of time, a biblical journey back thousands of years before the birth of Jesus, a journey back to a time when God heard the voices of the Hebrew people crying out in anguish because of their servitude and slavery. And God brought forth a man by the name of Moses. And God brought Moses forth to lead them out of Egyptian bondage and to set them on their way to a promised land. Now today in our journey, we're not going to focus on the full exodus. <laughs> But we are going to pause, we are going to park, if you will, at an egregious event that ensued during the journey. An event that is relevant today. Why? Because it confirms, y'all, that there is nothing new under the sun. And it reminds us that some things like racism, some things that need to change have yet to change. Oh, yeah, that's why, like Jesse Jackson, we need to what? Keep hope alive. It is the book of Exodus, y'all. The book of Exodus, not our text for today, but it is the book of Exodus, the second book of the Holy Bible that chronicles the hasty departure of Moses from Egypt after killing an Egyptian man for mistreating a fellow Hebrew. The Bible tells us that Moses, he fled to a place called Midian. And it was there, y'all, while sitting near a well, that Moses sees seven fine Nubian sisters coming up to fill their troughs of water for their father's flock. Now, seeing them being harassed by some other shepherds, Moses drives the other shepherds away, and he helps these seven fine sisters water their flock. So the women, they go home to their daddy, and the daddy, because they came home quicker than normal, wanted to know why they were back so soon. And they said, well, Dad, uh, what had happened was, <laughs> and they went into telling him the story of what Moses did. <laughs> and their father said, well, why y'all sitting around here? Y'all need to go back and find that brother. Don't y'all know how hard it is to find a good man? <laughs> oh, I thought a few sisters would shout right there because a few sisters know some things have yet to change. So they go back and they get Moses and they bring Moses back and Moses stays with them and eventually he was given the oldest daughter. Her name was Zipporah. He was given Zipporah as his wife. Now it is clear from the text that Moses had a wife. It is clear from the text that her name was Zipporah. It is clear from the text that she was not a Hebrew. <laughs> Yet there is debate among theologians as to the nationality of Zipporah. <laughs> oh, and that's what brings us to our text for today. So come with me, if you will, to the book of Numbers, the 12th chapter, that first text, because in this holy writ, in this trove of timeless truth, we will find the account of Miriam and Aaron, the older siblings of Moses. And we find that they have a problem with Moses because of who he married. Let's look at the text. Let's look at the text in verse 1. Let's read it in your loudest voice with me. Ready, set, go. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Now, if you ever have studied the Bible, you will learn that the Cushites were descendants of a man named Cush. Cush was the son of Ham. Ham was one of the sons 
of Noah. And you will learn that it was the Cushites who migrated to and settled in Ethiopia in East Africa. And so the descendants of Cush, these Cushites, were black Africans. Now, while there is no debate whether Moses married Zipporah, there is debate whether Zipporah was this Cushite, whether Zipporah was black. Now, why would theologians debate this? Why would they dispute this? And why would they even dismiss the plausibility that Moses, a biblical icon, could marry a black woman? Well, beloved, I submit to you, some things have yet to change. See, racism has been and continues to be systemic. And the victims of racism continue to have to deal with it. Oh, but racist people, they need to know that God does not like it. And the text today, beloved, will prove it. Moses and Aaron, they spoke openly complaining about Moses' wife. Let's look at verse 2 of the text. Let's look at verse 2 of the text. It says, has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. See, they spoke openly and against Moses' wife. They spoke against his boo, y'all, his, his baby. They spoke against her. Why? Because she was a Cushite, because she was black. Yes, some things have yet to change. Some things, my brothers and sisters, are still going on today. Martin Luther King would be displeased to understand that still today, the 11 o'clock hour on a Sunday morning is still the most segregated hour in this country. If you don't don't believe me look around wherever you are look around right now but like Miriam and Aaron there are people today who speak out openly and negatively against those who don't look like them who speak out openly and negatively against those whose skin does not blend with theirs especially those whose skin has been splendidly shaded by mother nature's son oh there is black hate there is brown hate there is Asian hate and yes there is white hate there is more than enough hate in this world. Oh, I wish Roberta Flack and Donnie Hathaway would come back and sing that song, Where Is the Love? Yes, people, they racistly speak, they racistly tweet, they racistly joke, y'all, but God helped them all because one day God is going to judge them all. So, beloved, do not get fixated on a person's color. And here's your first black history biblical learning point for today. Color does not matter to God. <laughs> Character is what matters. Turn to somebody and tell them color doesn't matter to God. <laughs> Character is what matters. <laughs> yes, Zipporah saved Moses' life. When God was going to strike him down because he failed to circumcise his son and she stepped in and did it. So God approved of her character because it is character and not color that matters to God. So in verse two, we learn that Miriam and Aaron, they spoke openly against Moses asking, hasn't God also spoken through us? See, they began, beloved, to put Moses down. And I found something interesting from that perspective. Many times racists, racist people, they like to put others down. <laughs> and they like to do it to build a case to make themselves feel better. <laughs> now even though they are clearly in the majority, <laughs> they make it seem as if they are in the minority. <laughs> See, that's how reverse discrimination came about. When the majority presents a case that helping the minority catch up, not get ahead, but helping them catch up, is somehow discriminatory to them. 
Well, I've got a second biblical learning for you today, a black history point, and it's simply this. Bigots are more concerned about themselves than others. Bigots are more concerned about themselves than others. What does the Bible teach us? The Bible says that we should think more highly of others others than we do of ourselves. But that is not what happens with bigots. And that is not what happened with Miriam and Aaron. Miriam and Aaron, they had what I call that what about us mentality. They had that don't we matter, that you can't replace us mentality. So they went to the court of public opinion to make a case that Moses' choice to marry a black woman was somehow a black mark on his ability to lead. Oh, but that's when God intervened. So I need to take you to verse 3 of our text. Verse 3 of our text in the book of Numbers. Verse 3 of our text. It says, now Moses was a very humble man. More humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. And perhaps, my brothers and sisters, it was his humility that allowed him to see the beauty of diversity to allow him to see that in God's sight everyone is precious regardless of their race their creed or their culture so God hearing and seeing what went on was displeased oh and God called a special meeting now go down to verse 4 y'all if you will and I need to hear you on this verse 4 let us read it together at once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out to the tent of the meeting, all three of you. So the three of them went out. Oh, my brothers and sisters, let me drop this third black history Bible learning on you and we can get ready to get up out of here. It's simply this. When God calls a special meeting, somebody's usually in trouble. Let me say that again. When God calls a special meeting, somebody's usually in trouble. Oh, some of y'all remember back in the day when you did something wrong at home and your mama or your daddy told you to go to your room and said, I'll be in there in a few minutes to meet with you. Most of us know that meeting usually did not go real well. Most of us understood that we were in a troubled situation. So they talked about Moses and God was not pleased. So God told the, them to come forward, but he told Miriam and Aaron, he told the two of them, he said, I want you to step forward. And then y'all remember how your mama, or your grandmama used to point that finger at you? and say, you better hear me and hear me good. And that's what God was saying. God said, you better hear me and hear me good. God said, when I usually talk to my prophets, I usually speak to them in dreams and in visions. He said, but not so with my servant Moses. He said, with Moses, I speak with him directly as if a man is speaking to another man. I speak to Moses directly and you have the nerve, you have the unmitigated gall to speak bad of him because the wife I chose for him was not your skin folk. Oh, I remember Dr. Jeremiah Wright said, everybody who's your skin folk aren't your kin folk. So we got to understand, beloved, God does not like it when we put other people down because of their skin. So God's anger burned. And the Bible says that when his cloud departed, Aaron looked at Miriam, and Miriam had turned white as snow. And it was only then, and you can read this in verse 11, it was only then that Aaron realized that racism was a sin, and he confessed his sin to Moses. Beloved, if we are to be the church that God desires us to be, if we are to be the Christians that God 
desires us to be. We've got to eradicate racism. We've got to eradicate racism and sexism and ageism and individualism and domestic terrorism. Yes, excuse my ebonics, but all those isms that should be anums, we got to eradicate all of them. Let us not become blind to racism, but let us become blind to race. It is time for churches to become blind to race. It is time for institutions to become blind to race. It is time for housing policies and insurance practices to become blind to race. And it is time for people, y'all, to become blind to race. It's time to begin seeing the heart of people, begin seeing the potential of people, begin seeing the good of people, begin seeing the strife of people, and not focusing on the color of people. For the Bible says there is no difference between male and female. There is no difference between rich and poor. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. So there is no difference between black and white and brown and Asian. There is no difference. Don't you know there is no difference between black babies and white babies, between brown babies and Asian babies, between Indian babies and interracial babies. Don't you know they all cry, they all smile, they all eat, they all poop, they all need attention and affection and protection. Why? Because they are all the same. Now just because some things have yet to change does not mean that they aren't meant to change. When racism rears its ugly head, we the church must take a stand. We must take a stand to fight it. And when racists raise their hateful voices, we the church must take a stand to silence it. God says that we should turn the other cheek, but he does not say that we should turn a deaf ear. So let us hear the vibrant voices of those who have been disproportionately alienated. Let us hear the voices of those who have been unjustly separated and segregated. Let us hear the voices of those who have been unfairly incarcerated. Let us not shun their struggles. Let us not cancel their contributions. Do you not know black history is American history? And black people, like all people, are God's people. Black history is something we're living and something we're making every day. And though God is no respecter of persons, God is a rejecter of persons. And God will reject those who hate, those who discriminate because of somebody's race. Well, some things have yet to change. Some things have yet to change. But I believe that they can change. I believe that they can change. They can change if hearts change. And you and I, we know a heart regulator. You and I, we know a heart fixer. You and I, we know a heart surgeon. And his name is Jesus. Jesus can touch hearts. Jesus can change hearts because he is a heart fixer. 
So I believe that things can change. I believe that things will change. I believe if we the church, if we the ecclesia, if we the called of God, the chosen of God, that we must be change agents. We must be change ambassadors. We must be change brokers, change champions, change deputies, change initiators, change operators, change managers, and change ministers. And if we do, now let me clean that up. Let me speak those things that are not as though they were. When we do, when we do, life will change. When we do, things will change. They will markedly change, positively change, meaningfully change, permanently change. And even if those things which need to change, those things that have yet to change, even if they aren't changed down here. We can still shout hallelujah. We can still say thank you, Jesus. We can still lift holy hands. We can still do our holy dance because God promised that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the archangel will come, the trumpet it will sound the heavens they will open the dead in christ they will rise and jesus jesus he will appear and those who believe in jesus we all everybody we all will be changed happy black history sunday y'all Happy Black History Month. Like the old folk used to say, if God willing and the creek don't rise, I'll see y'all in the same place on next week. But until then, keep on praying, keep on hoping, keep on believing, keep on fighting. Things can change, things will change. When you make a change, hearts can change, minds can change, people can change, but we've got to do what God called us to do. No more sitting on the sideline, no more talking in the background. God's people have to raise up a banner. God's people have to raise up a new standard. God's people have to stand up and start shedding up. We've got to let the world know it's not right. It's not right. And we're not going to stand for it. Give God some hand clap of praise in the house today. Some things have got to change. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They spoke against Moses simply because of his Cushite wife. They spoke against the man of God, a biblical icon, simply because he married a black woman. Some things, my brothers and sisters, have yet to change. But if we keep pushing forward and keep believing and praying, I believe things can change. To God be 